But if you go back beyond just a decade, you can see some some like real booms and busts for this company. So if you were to have bought this thing for a multi-decade period of time, it hasn't been the greatest investment because of those boom bust cycles. Other one, obviously it's on this video, so we think it's we think it's cheap. Today, we're going to focus on Photronics and Amcor. Amcor, we have covered in the past. Photronics, we haven't discussed here, at least not in depth. So we have a really exciting show coming up. Also, you may notice we are on the road visiting our families. So we are going to be Chipstock Roadshow the next couple of weeks with varying backgrounds and possibly varying video and sound quality. So please stick with us because we are covering a lot of new and small businesses in the coming weeks. I don't have my wonderful green wallpaper behind me, but I do have some greenery right here. And Nick, I think, has forgot a shaver. So we're going to try to remedy that in the next couple of days. But Nick, how do you feel? Uh, we're actually back to where we started, Casey. When we started Shipstock Investor, we were also on the road. I think we've learned a few things. Let's see how the quality goes. And yeah. Folks, I apologize if you don't like the, um, it's not a five o'clock shadow. It's a one week shadow at this point. Uh, I'm not feeling it. I'll be cleaned up by the time we do the next video. So sorry. Okay. Let's dive into our first company, Photronics. Nick, what does Photronics produce and how does it fit into the semiconductor industry? Photronics makes lithography photo masks. So if you missed two videos ago, we talked about five companies that ASML cannot live without. We did a general overview of the photo mask industry. That was our, where we kind of introduced Photronics for the first time. Go watch that first. Watch that video first for a general overview of the photo mask space and then come back. Okay. Now that you're back. Casey, I think we should use the semiconductor industry flowchart first. So what we're talking about with Photronics is chip manufacturing equipment. So that critical choke point here, we have a lot of companies that specialize in certain types of equipment because they're very, very expensive to make. And Photronics is one of those specialists that makes the actual photo masks. That's where the, the light is shown through historically a piece of quartz. More recently with the advent of EUV, you have multiple layers of various materials to, to help facilitate these very, very miniaturized features. This is what Photronics does. Uh, and then Casey, maybe let's jump over to specifically the steps in the process of manufacturing a silicon wafer. We use this a lot. Uh, this is from an applied materials slide you see lithography over there on the left asml the dominant player in this particular step but photronics makes these photo masks along with some others that are very very critical asml does not make these things and therefore this is kind of an inseparable perk of the lithography space that doesn't often get called out as a dedicated step because it is part of the lithography process, but it's a specific piece of equipment that, that you need to have uh, if you're doing any type of lithography, especially extreme ultraviolet, deep ultraviolet lithography. So, uh, that's what Photronics does. They actually make the masks. Nick, just as a side point, we talked about this a little bit in our ASML video that you referenced, but there's the companies that make the machines that produce the photo masks. And then there's companies that produce the actual photo masks. So IMS is the leader in making the machines. We have IMS and then also we discuss Micronic. Those two companies make the machines that companies like Photronics purchase from. And then Photronics uses those machines to produce photo masks. So we're talking about two different types of businesses here, just to clarify. Right. And uh, that's, a, that's a really important point, Casey. IMS is majority owned by Intel. They make the most 
advanced photo mask writers, specifically for EUV extreme ultraviolet lithography. And then also another peer in this space that actually make the machines is applied materials. They also have some machines that write the, these photo mask writers. So that's kind of, we've been completely content to have our exposure to this little niche of the industry via applied materials. But Casey, again, as you mentioned, this is the first time we're really covering the actual photo masks themselves, the plates uh, that the light is shown through uh, via Photronics. And so this is why we're doing a dedicated bit here on, on this company, because they don't make the machines, as you said, they use the machines to make just the photo masks themselves. Competitors for Photronics would be companies like Toppen and Dynapon Printing. One quarter of the sales per Photronics is directed towards flat panel displays. And I'll briefly mention the financial metrics for the company. Market cap is around $1.2 billion. The Q3 revenue for 2023, $224 million, which is down 2% quarter over quarter, but up 2% year over year. $476 million in cash and short-term investments. And debt is at $20 million at the end of that July quarter. And as mentioned before, Photronics makes only photo masks. So it is a pure play in the semiconductor industry, which of course has its positives and negatives. So Nick, what are some of those positives and negatives for Photronics? Yeah, so the pure play, again, as I mentioned before, Casey, a lot of companies in this space specialize it, it, within the semiconductor manufacturing equipment. And so whenever you have a specialist, you tend to have these periods of cyclicality that, that pop up. Maybe you have a year or two of downturn followed by a year or two of upcycle. Over the long term, uh, at least over the last decade, those, those peaks and valleys have led to a nice increase for Photronics stock. But if you go back beyond just a decade, you can see some, some like real booms and busts for this company. So if you were to have bought this thing for a multi-decade period of time, it hasn't been the greatest investment because of those boom bust cycles. However, we mentioned this before in the previous videos, these photo masks are getting very, very expensive as we enter uh, very, very advanced chip making, especially EUV, extreme ultraviolet. A single photo mask can cost Estimates are tens of millions of dollars, at least, you know, analyst estimates, tens of millions of dollars. Photronics doesn't just, you know, throw out a price tag to go buy one of these things from them. But I, I think it illustrates the point that as chip making intensity increases over time, you know, those features on the chip get smaller, more complex. The printing of the photo mask itself gets increasingly complex as well. I mentioned this before, historically a photo mask is just a quartz plate. Now it's actually printed in dozens of layers with different materials. Some of those layers allow the ultraviolet light to shine through, others reflect it, others absorb it, so that you end up with these like little, little tiny slivers of just several nanometer wide dimensions that get shown on the silicon wafer to essentially print those features on what would eventually become the chip. So I think that's a positive for the company going forward. Photo masks are getting more expensive and I think this could turn into a very, very specialized critical piece of the semiconductor manufacturing industry that could lead to some sustained profitable growth for photronics over the next five to 10 years. Casey, you also pointed this out though, that being said, most advanced chip making is concentrated in Taiwan, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing. So you pointed this out on their website, over half of Potronics revenue is going to be tied to Asia, probably specifically Taiwan. So of course there's going to be those geopolitical risks involved with this business as well, in addition to you know, potentially some cyclicality. Nick, at the most recent earnings call, the management at Photronics was asked about the health of the semiconductor industry. And the CTO, Christopher Progler, said that the industry, of course, is expected to be down through 2023, but have that bounce back in 2024. And he said the photo mask industry 
and the few companies that are in it are expected to be flat for the rest of this year, but have that bounce back in 2024. As we mentioned before, Photronics was down 2% quarter over quarter, but it did have a 2% year over year growth. So it is outperforming this market in general. Currently, Photronics stock price is right around $19, $20 per share. The stock is currently trading for a little over 10 times PE ratio and just over nine times trailing 12 month free cash flow. So, Nick, what's our conclusion on this stock? What are we thinking regarding Photronics? Is it going to be added to our portfolio anytime soon? Right. That's that's always the big question. I think everyone fast forwards through to far as what we're buying. It looks like a very, very cheap stock, which is how we lured all of you in. We were talking about cheap chip stocks. It's interesting. This is really interesting. I wonder if we're at some sort of inflection point for the long-term health of the photo mask part of the industry. So yeah, it's on our watch list for the fourth quarter of 2023. And, you know, if we do get an upturn in the semiconductor a manufacturing industry in 2024, and that sustains through 2025, 2026, like we think it might because of these dozens of chip fabs that are under construction, dozens more that are being retrofitted with new equipment. Of course, lots of photo masks and some EUV photo masks are going to need to be purchased. Yeah, we definitely could see some upside for Photronics at this point. And I do also think, you know, this is just our speculation here at this point. There could be some consolidation in this part of the semiconductor manufacturing space as well. Maybe Photronics and some of its peers could be a target of an acquisition at some point. Um, but you know, that's not, that wouldn't be the thesis behind us buying, but yes, Casey, we're monitoring. We might add this at some point to our basket, the semiconductor manufacturing stocks, because as you may recall, when we've covered the two big semiconductor ETFs in the past. SMH, Vanek Semiconductor ETF, and SOX, S-O-X-X, the iShares Semiconductor ETF. Tiny companies like Photronics are not in that portfolio. So this might be an interesting one if we do hit that inflection point. But it's a small cap, so this would be a very, very small add to our portfolio if we made it. Okay, let's move on to Amcor. Amcor, we have talked about a couple of times in a few videos, and they provide packaging and test services to the semiconductor industry. Nick, what are some of the key products that Amcor has? Okay, yes. Yeah, so Amcor is known as an OSAT, O-S-A-T, Outsourced Semiconductor Assembly and Test. So a lot of a big companies do a lot of this themselves. They might do some of their own in-house packaging. So that's after the wafer is made, the chips, the dye are cut up into little squares, and then you have to package those onto a circuit board. So a lot of big businesses do this themselves, but Amcor is one of the largest OSATs. Some of its competitors are Hyundai Precision Industry, or better known as Foxconn, JBL Industry, ticker symbol JBL. This is where Amcor competes. Amcor is a South Korean company. Uh, that's where the name comes from. Uh, when they started back in the late 60s, early 70s, the name is kind of an uh, amalgamation of American Korean technology. Um, and so they're one of the largest, been around a long time, a lot of partners, uh, deeply embedded in the ecosystem. Taiwan Semiconductor actually uses Amcor quite a bit for packaging all sorts of stuff. It could be PCs, smartphones, you name it, any type of electronic circuitry, Amcor probably has some sort of process to handle the packaging of those chips and testing of those chips. Amcor has four segments that it reports its revenue in. Communications, which would be smartphones, tablets, that's 41% of its revenue. Automotive and industrial, 23% of the revenue. Computing, which includes data centers, PCs, laptops, that's 20% of the revenue. Consumer electronics, 16% of the revenue. And the sales did decrease 
in the first half of this year, 6% down from 2022. And as we've discussed in many of the videos, most of this decrease is from the smartphone and PC sales. Nick, tell us a little bit about the outlook for Amcor. Yeah, it's actually quite good, Casey. As you mentioned, that smartphone segment, uh, over 40% of sales. Uh, after a massive decline, it's still 40% of sales in its most recent financial filings. Big impact there. If the smartphone market stabilizes or rebounds a bit in 2024, that obviously would be helpful. But two areas that you mentioned uh, in those segments, Casey, I think provide some growth opportunity for Amcor in 2024. The computing segment, specifically for data centers, so AI servers, all the rage, Amcor can do some packaging and testing on that front. And then the second one, interestingly, you said consumer electronics. What they're actually doing in that is, is a lot of wearable devices, IoT devices, and there's like some really advanced packaging that needs to take place for, let's say like a smartwatch uh, and maybe an Apple watch or something in a, the Android ecosystem, like pixel, pixel watches or Samsung watches, the chips are really, really tiny. And there's a lot of miniaturization going on in, in packaging up advanced features, chips that control advanced features in these things. So they actually called that out as a, an area of strength as well. I will mention though, that. You know, this is also kind of a very cyclical business as well, specifically talking about those consumer electronics, the wearables. So I don't see that as a big long-term growth driver for Amcor, uh, but if they can break into that server market, because it's a pretty small segment for them at this point, that I think is where you could see some sustained growth for Amcor going forward. But, you know, as already mentioned, this is a fairly competitive marketplace. Uh, the OSATs, the outsourced assembly and test, not only do they compete with each other, but they also compete with some in-house production lines as well. Taiwan Semi does it, Samsung does it, uh, all those big integrated device manufacturers do it to a certain extent. So that's, that's kind of a big risk, I think, for Amcor uh, for its growth prospects going forward. Let's talk a little bit about valuation for Amcor. Stock price is about $22 right now. It recently fell about 20%. PE ratio is 9.5 and price to free cash flow is 26. So why the huge pullback in stock price and why is there this large discrepancy between the two numbers and valuation? Okay, so I think the stock price is under pressure for two reasons. The first we already talked about, there's downward pressure on revenue and profits because of the smartphone market. That's going to last through the end of 2023. We'll see how the 2024 outlook looks when management reports it. The other reason for the stock price falling though is recently it was announced that a very key shareholder was going to be offloading some of its stock and that's the Kim family, which founded Amcor back in the late 1960s. They said they were selling about 10 million shares through various entities for about $24 a piece. At the time that was announced, the stock price was in the high 20s. So of course, you're going to have downward pressure on the stock if a controlling shareholder suddenly says we're selling for only $24. And I think that's maybe put some questions in the mind of, of the market. You know, why are they selling so much? But they still remain a top shareholder though. So. Uh, perhaps this is just short term. At any rate, that's why the stock price has done what it's done as of late. As for the valuation, so yeah, Casey, it works very cheap from a PE ratio, and perhaps the stock is cheap from a PE ratio standpoint if the business rebounds next year. But on an adjusted basis, non gap free cash flow of about 26, a lot of that is because the company is finishing up its new factory in Vietnam. So of course, free cash flow is different from GAT, net income, which is used to calculate PE uh, because big property plant and equipment purchases are expensed over time to calculate PE ratio. Free cash flow, you realize those cash expenses when cash leaves the company to make the payment. So elevated expenses related to that new factory in Vietnam, 
Uh, it's supposed to be open by the end of this year and ramp up a production. So those expenses will start to be lapped in calendar year 2024. Yeah, I think that this is another one. Obviously, it's on this video, so we think it's we think it's cheap. If Amcor stabilizes its smartphone business and gets some new growth outlets headed into 2024, as advanced chip packaging becomes ever more important in the years ahead. <laughs> <laughs>